You're listening to a Brooklyn Nets episode of the Jacob Falk Show. He's breaking down the team's latest goings on as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Falk. Here he is. Jacob Falk. Hey, Nets fans. Welcome to another Brooklyn Nets episode here on the Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk, except no imitation. It looked touch and go there for a little bit with the Nets. They were trading wins and losses. But now they've righted the ship. They've won five straight. They've won blowouts. They've won close games. They've won games where their offense didn't show up. They've won games where they've put up over 115 points. It's a great time to be a Nets fan. And what's really making me very happy is this team is finally realizing that they need to play defense to win. You take a look at points per game for the Nets. They're only 20th in the league at 106. But opposing points per game, they're 9th in the league. With 103.3. So despite all the offensive firepower that the Nets have, it's really been their defense that's lifted them to their 7-3 and record. Putting them in third place in the Eastern Conference. Only one game behind the Sixers. A Sixers team that is going to fall off because Joel Embiid is entering health and safety protocols. I mean, it's kind of interesting. With Kyrie, this team would be putting up like 110 points per game easily. In fact, there would be some nights that they'd hit 120. But their defense may take a step back. One thing that I've really noticed is, for lack of a better term, a blue-collar mentality taking hold on the Nets. They know that they've got to do the little things if they want to win take charges, close out on defense, get their hands up, gain rebound. With a guy like Kyrie not there, who can put up 25 points per game, they really can't outscore opponents at will. So that's forcing them to play better defense and to execute the fundamentals better. I mean, one thing that I love is Blake Griffin putting on the hard hat and putting on the work boots. That's great. This guy is turning into Gerald Wallace, and I love it. Just doing all the little things that's not going to show up in the box score, but if you watch the games... You know that this guy's making a huge impact. Taking charges, hitting the floor for loose balls, shooting when he needs to, 
dunking when he needs to. I saw some Nets fans earlier this year getting really upset at Blake Griffin. No, Griffin's really good. It's not going to show up in the box score. It's the little things. But he does those little things incredibly well. I'll tell you another guy who's really impressed me. Patty Mills. Remember when the Nets signed him? I told you I wasn't a big fan of Mills. Maybe I just wasn't watching him closely enough. I've watched every game this guy has played this year. I love him. This guy's a spark plug off the bench. Shoots the ball incredibly well. Executes on defense. Has a winning mentality. I really, really like him. Like, think about this bench for a minute. Patty Mills... Paul Millsap, and LaMarcus Aldridge. Mills is a former NBA champion. LaMarcus Aldridge is probably going to get sixth man of the year votes. Paul Millsap, now that he's coming off the bench, yes, he's not having as big an impact because his playing time has gone down, But just by the eye test, you see similarities between what he's doing now and what he did for the Atlanta Hawks. Yes, he's scoring less, but he's rebounding the ball really well. He's playing good defense. He's really physical. I'm starting to like Millsap. I want to see him more. He should be getting more than 10.8 minutes per game. I'll say that. Guys like Javon Carter and DeAndre Bembry should not be playing over Paul Millsap. Some people have been concerned with James Harden. His field goal percentage is down. His points per game is down. And yeah, I get that. But if you look at his three-point percentage, it's higher now than it's ever been at any end of a season in Harden's career. It's 39.7% now. In his third year, In the NBA, he shot 39% from three. That's his high watermark. So if 39.7 holds, he'll have a new career high. I mean, the thing with Harden is, yes, his raw scoring is down. But you got to realize something. He's playing with Kevin Durant. I mean, Durant is going to score more. He just is. He's going to take more shots. And that's okay. He should. And you've got a guy in Joe Harris who's going to take a lot of shots. That's his one job, catch and shoot. There isn't as much of an opportunity for Harden to go off. When he needs to go off, He goes off. You saw it yesterday. Against the Raptors in the fourth quarter. He was absolutely insane. He dropped 16 points. He was penetrating. He was hitting threes. He really closed that game out for the Nets. Give him credit. He played every second of that fourth quarter. And really held down the fort. I mean, realize, it's been a long time since Harden's played on a team that's been this talented. 
It's been a while since he's been the second banana. That takes some getting used to. It does seem like Harden has found a little bit of a groove. His last five games, he's been great. Naturally, that coincides with the Nets' winning streak. When James Harden plays well, the Nets play well. When James Harden doesn't play well, the Nets don't play well. Yeah, he's James Harden. He's very important to the Nets. Like, take a look at the last five games for Harden. Against the Pacers, he had 29 points. Against the Pistons, he had a triple-double. Against the Hawks, he had a double-double. Against the Pistons again, he had a triple-double. Against the Raptors, he had a double-double and put up 28 points. Do you want Harden to be putting up 20 to 25 points per game? Yeah, of course you do. Because you know he's capable of it. You saw him lead the NBA in scoring three straight years. You saw him put up at least 29 points per game five straight years. You know he's capable of that. It's okay to want more from Harden. I want more from Harden. He's shooting just 40% from the field. He's better than that. But the reality is... He's still learning how to play in this new role of being the second banana and playing on a roster that's so incredibly talented. And also, the new foul rules are really hurting him. Now, he seems to have adapted to that a little bit better as of recently. But early on, it really was rough for him. He wasn't getting to the line a lot. With the exception of the Pacers game, James Harden doesn't have a game this year where he's been to the free throw line more than six times. You know what his career average is for free throw attempts per game? 8.7. This is a huge change. This rule change is affecting Harden more than any player in the NBA. But it seems like he's adapting to it. Yeah, there are going to be some growing pains, but I still love James Harden. He's still one of the best players in the NBA. You take him on your team in a heartbeat. And I want the Nets to sign him to a max contract tomorrow. Of course, no Nets show would be complete without talking about the elephant not in the room, Kyrie Irving. There was a little hope when... Eric Adams was officially elected mayor of New York City that he would amend the vaccine rules to make it so Kyrie could play. But Adams has said that New York City is not going to change their rules. This is between the NBA and Kyrie, which is absolutely ridiculous. The NBA is perfectly fine with Kyrie Irving playing. If Kyrie Irving was a Dallas Maverick or a member of the Miami Heat or a Chicago Bull or a Boston Celtic or a Cleveland Cavalier, etc., etc., he'd be allowed to play. The reason that Kyrie isn't playing is because New York City has made it so 
in order to partake in indoor sports, you must be vaccinated. This has nothing to do with the NBA. There is no NBA vaccine mandate. So don't tell me this is an NBA issue. That's just nonsense. So one of two things is happening here. Either Eric Adams just doesn't know that that's the case. I find that hard to believe, but he could just not know that. There are a lot of things that people should know that they don't. Or Eric Adams is lying. To get Brooklynites to support him. Oh my God, a politician lying. Hope you were sitting down for that. What I'd love to have happen is for Kyrie, a representative from the Players Association, Adam Silver, and Eric Adams have a Zoom meeting, and they get to the bottom of this. You want to have a third party in there? Fine. I'll do it. I'm a big Nets fan, but I'm also vaccinated, and I think everyone should be vaccinated. Or someone else can do it. It doesn't need to be me. But if you want a third party there, let's do it. I don't think this is an NBA issue. This is a New York City issue. Now, look, I don't want to get into the pros and cons of mask mandates. That's not the purpose of this show. All I'll say is, Adam seems to be a little more moderate than his predecessor, Bill de Blasio. He wants to end the school mask mandate. So it seems like he's open to rolling back these mask mandates. Also, I'll say this. Adams doesn't come into power until January 1st. Would it surprise you if he changed his mind by then? Would it surprise you if he said, you know what, cases have fallen to such a point that I'm comfortable carving out this sort of an exception? I don't know exactly what it would be if it would just include professional athletes if it would also include Broadway performers or people who work in the hospitality field or gyms or something like that. But it wouldn't stun me if in two months Adams changes his mind. But I'll say this. One of the ways that you can get him to change his mind is to either send messages to his office. You can absolutely do that. Or, the better way of going about it, get vaccinated. According to NYC.gov, 74% of New York City residents have received at least one dose of of the COVID vaccine. At least 67.6% of people are fully vaccinated. God only knows why you'd get one dose but not the other, but I digress. Those numbers should be higher. If those numbers get to 80%, maybe more, Adams will have no choice but to change his mind. There is a myth going around that politicians love doing this because 
it gives them the ability to exert influence over their constituents. No politician likes having these mask mandates. You know how I know that? Because it's absolutely killing the economy. What's one thing that voters care about a lot? How much money they have? And will they have a job? These mask mandates are costing people jobs and by extension, costing people money. You think politicians like that? They don't. I understand the argument, then don't impose it. And again, I don't want to get into an argument of pro-mandate and con-mandate. That's not the purpose here. I'm just saying that one way that you can convince Eric Adams to change the rule forbidding Kyrie to play because it's not an NBA rule. It's a New York City rule. One way that you can do that is by either writing to him or, more importantly, if you live in New York City, get vaccinated. Even if you don't live in New York City and you're not vaccinated, Get vaccinated anyway. Look, gun to my head, I do think that Kyrie Irving will play for the Nets at some point. Do I think it'll be because he gets vaccinated? Sadly, no. But I do think the mandate can change. It kind of brings up an interesting question, though. How will the Nets integrate him into their team? Yes, they'll welcome him back, but is he going to jump right into the next game? Or is he going to go on a conditioning assignment? Also, how long until the Nets say, yeah, no, forget about it. You're not playing even though you're cleared to play. Like, hypothetically... If on April 1st, the mandate changes, will the Nets clear Kyrie to play? Or will they say, no, we don't want you impacting our chemistry? I don't know, but I think that's an interesting subplot to this. Is there an artificial deadline that the Nets will set So far, they've said if Kyrie is legally able to play, we'll welcome him back with open arms. But as the playoffs get closer, do you want him coming back? Like, if it's January or February, okay. Even early March, I can live with. Mid to late March? Early April? That's tough. That's really, really tough. I don't know how the Nets will feel about that. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with the Nets going forward. I'm going to be locked into their game tonight against the Bulls. Two of the Eastern Conference's best teams going at it. This is going to be must-see TV. A lot better than Bears Steelers, let me tell you. You have no idea how much I wish I didn't have to watch that game. I'll record it and watch it later. That way I can talk about it on the regular episode of the Jacob Volk Show that's going to come your way tomorrow. Obviously, they come every weekday afternoon. Next week, you're going to get a New York Islanders show. Week after that, you're going to get a Brooklyn Nets show. On Friday's regular episode of the Jacob Volk show, you're going to get an interview that I'm going to do with David Kaiser, the author of a book 
on the 1965 NFL season. New York Jets instant recaps come your way after every game. Until next time, I'm Jacob Volk, and always remember, if you disagree with me, you're wrong.